Okay, I'm going to start. Uh, yeah, just a little bit of introduction. My name is uh, George. Uh, sometimes I'm called Dr. G by my students. Uh, I'm a retired professor from uh, State University in California, and I've taught uh, political science uh, for literally about 46 years, and I uh, have a PhD in politics from the University of Leeds in Northern England. Um, and one of the major fo fo focuses of my interests and in research and writing is United States foreign policy. But I've also taught uh, courses in U.S. history, U.S. government, and uh, a, a lot, and even uh, America, U.S. intellectual thought, by the way, which is a, a, a topic in and of itself. So I spent a lot of time trying to figure out what, what goes on in the United States. Um, I'm on a kind of a, an interesting trip right now. I've been going around Europe for the last six weeks. And almost everywhere I go, uh, when I get off a train, I get in a taxi and the taxi driver uh, hears my voice and the first thing I hear is this question, what's wrong with the United States, okay? And uh, since I'm being driven to a hotel, I only have five or 10 minutes to answer that person. Occasionally, the taxi driver stays put and gives me 15 or 20 minutes to uh, continue the answer, <laughs> okay? What I'd like to do uh, tonight is to try to answer that question in a little more detail than I've provided to the taxi drivers, okay? Mm -hmm. uh, but I do know there's at least seven or eight taxi drivers throughout Europe that are more educated about the United States now than they were before they picked me up, okay? <laughs> um, when, they, when I'm asked about what's wrong with the United States, you can guess what the topic or focus of their question is. The first one is always, what's the, about Trump, okay? And uh, then they ask, can he really be elected president of the United States while he's in jail? And, uh, and the like. The next theme that comes up is Biden. Uh, what's wrong with Biden as well? He seems to be losing it, okay? <laughs> And then the third is the one that I have the most focus and interest in, and that's related to the role that U.S. is playing in the war in the, the war over Ukraine against Russia. We gave a talk here about three weeks ago that gave a lot of background to my view about the United States' position up until, say, February uh, of 2022. Uh, hopefully, if I'm invited back again, I might be able to give an update of the war. Uh, the fourth area of inquiry that I'm asked about is about the violence in the United States. And uh, we'll mention this in a moment. What I'd like to do in, in this presentation uh, is to address that question in several different areas. One. I would like to characterize how I see the United States at this moment related to what I call uh, a series of crises. Uh, each crisis can be examined uh, separately, but I do believe very, very strongly that they're tied together or they're interwoven. And then when I lay out those crises, and I probably would like to go through it fairly quickly, because I know you probably want to get to Q&A before long. The second thing I'd like to do is to give a layout what I believe are the causes of the crises that I'm going to describe. And in doing that, I'm going to provide uh, some history, some conceptual understanding of uh, politics, and also some theoretical ideas about politics as well. Uh, what I'd like to do in laying out these causes is to establish a historical context. I'm a strong, strong believer in uh, analyzing developments, events, and for that matter, human agency within the context, within historical context. Uh, and then the third thing we'd like to talk about in conclusion 
what's the role of Trump in all of this? And then what's the role of Russia? And maybe uh, what's the role of Trump and Russia in this story? And I think I'm going to surprise some of you about some of the things that I've observed. Uh, I guess the final point I want to make in this brief introduction is uh, when you're talking about politicians or political figures, uh, I generally think of them in terms of human agency, meaning people have power and influence to varying degrees uh, to, to, to try to affect uh, events around them, particularly on a, on a high political level. But what I believe very, very strongly, I can't examine Biden or I can't examine Trump just solely by looking at them as personalities or, psych or as, social psych as, psycho as, uh, as psychological beings. I have to look at them again uh, within uh, a context, which then refers me to uh, this famous quote from Marx that was in uh, the 18th Brumaire of Louis Bonaparte, Bonaparte which was uh, written in 1852. Uh, Marx said, uh, related to this point I just made, men make their own history but they do not make it just as they please. They do not make it under circumstances chosen by themselves, but under circumstances directly encountered, given, and transmitted from the past. Okay? And I, I strongly believe in that as a historian and uh, a political being. Now, the next thing I'd like to do is to talk about, uh, to characterize what I think is wrong with the United States in 25 words or less, okay? Uh, this is something we could talk about for months and months and months, to be very candid. I think there are three separate but interrelated factors that I'd like to comment on. One is what I refer to as the breakdown of the social fabric. Second is the crisis of political legitimacy. And the third is the crisis of global hegemony. And I think the US is facing all three of these problems uh, uh, simultaneously. And what we're gonna talk about when we look at the causes as to why that's happening. Um, the first point, the breakdown of the, of the social fabric. Uh, one can see that on political levels, economic levels, social levels, and perhaps most importantly on psychological levels. And I'll make some pointed remarks in a moment. Uh, I've broken this breakdown of the social fabric into three, into four char char uh, factors, which uh, is a way teachers do things, okay? <laughs> although they are interrelated. The first, and perhaps the most, uh, well, all of them are pretty obvious. The first is political polarization, okay? Um, in America, in the United States today, people live in silos, okay? Silos. Silos, silos are these grain, these things out in the farm areas, okay? and you put things in your silo and then you don't deal with anything else, okay? Mm -hmm. And there are many kinds of levels. Uh, obviously, Democrats don't talk to Republicans and Republicans don't talk to uh, Democrats. Uh, liberals don't talk to the right wing. Right wing don't talk to liberals. Uh, women don't talk to men. Blacks don't talk to whites. Uh, it's, it's it, you know, these levels are intensified uh, strongly. On a personal level, uh, I've, nobody talks to me at all, okay, <laughs> because of my views on the war, for example. And I can tell you uh, stories that uh, are very sad related mm -hmm. to uh, how uh, I've been treated. I'll, I'll give you two examples, um, not to necessarily talk about me, but to give you examples of what, I, what we can experience. Back in 2000, and uh, this is before the war in fact, but it had to do with Russiagate. Uh, back in 2018, I was invited to give a talk 
at uh, the Unitarian Universalist Church in San Francisco on Russia Gate, and I was invited by the, a group called the Humanist Atheist Group. And you would think that a humanist atheist group was the most open-minded, <laughs> tolerant group of people you've ever met in your life. Uh, well, I stood in front of about 35 people and talked about my analysis of, uh, of politics and Biden, uh, not Biden, but uh, Trump and Clinton and the election of 216 and my views on Russiagate, etc. And the basic point I made was that uh, the Russians did not uh, uh, did not uh, make uh, Trump win the election. As I'm saying this, about 25 people stormed the stage and literally tried to beat the shit out of me, okay? I'm very serious about that. And I was traveling with a, a, a good friend of mine, Ricardo, a Puerto Rican man, and he was actually hit by this group because I criticized Hillary Clinton, okay, saying that she ran a horrible campaign and a number of other points which we'll make. Um, in May of last year, I was invited to a dinner in Chico where I used to teach. And there were about seven or eight facu retired faculty and a variety of people. And uh, somebody made a comment and, uh, saying that uh, Putin was a terrorist. It just came up and, and I said, that's not true. And I tried to make a point. And people start yelling at me, why don't you go live in Russia then, okay? These, were, these are good, decent, liberal people, okay, who believe in civil rights and, uh, and fairness and are against poverty, but they've, they've gone bonkers, okay. Uh, more, let me continue. Um, I think I've made my point. There's a political polarization in the country that's very extreme. Uh, the, the, sec the second point is extreme levels of economic inequality, uh, which I think is pretty transparent. Uh, homelessness is at the tip of this iceberg. Uh, when you look at indices about income and wealth distribution in the United States, they're quite frightening, is that the top 1% of the income or the wealth bracket owns some 72% of the wealth in the country. The bottom 50% of the U.S. population own, owns 2.4% of the wealth in the country. And if you want to extrapolate from that, dealing with whatever indices you want, uh, the figures become inc increasingly stark. Much of this has accelerated since the 1970s with the advent of a neoliberal economic accumulation model, which we will talk about in, in a while, okay? Um, the third area of the breakdown of the social fabric has to do with alienation. Uh, and if I haven't already talked about it, I'll make a few startling points. Uh, there's over 100,000 deaths every year from drug overdose. overdose. Um, in 2022, there were 49,000 suicides. Every single day in the United States, 14 military veterans commit suicide, okay? It goes on and on, okay? It's, uh, it's horrific. Um, and then when you um, talk about more overt violence, as you know, there are on average two mass shootings in the United States every single day. And already this year, there have been over 500 police killings in this country, in the U.S. And on average, the last three or four years, it's been around over 600 every year. Now, if you go back 10 years ago or 15 years ago, the numbers were much smaller, okay? Uh, so something is amiss in the United States. By the way, I, uh, I want to note about the police killings. The image of police killings is that all of them are black, young black men. That's not true. There are more white youth killed in the United States by police than black youth, okay? Uh, the third group is Hispanics, and then there's the amorphous others, and we're not quite sure who that group is. Probably 
gay or transgender people probably are on that list. Uh, I think the point has been made. What we can say, and this is not my ideas, this is, I'm taking them from a whole bunch of things that I, I, I've read, including a piece today by Chris Hedges in uh, Information Clearinghouse, where the United States, I think, is, is a traumatized society. And uh, I've been saying for quite some time is the U.S. has, is, has faced a collective uh, nervous breakdown. Now, what are the causes of this? Uh, we'll talk about them in more detail in a moment. But it, it's clearly uh, the Trump and the Democrats and Russiagate is at the root of the acceleration of this nervous breakdown and then the COVID lockdown and then the complexity uh, or the con confusion, political confusion of what COVID was about, et cetera, linked to Trump, et cetera, has, has, has accelerated to where I do believe very strongly the culture has faced uh, a, a nervous breakdown. In a, in a structural sense, what I believe has happened, and not just in the last six or seven years, but has been going on for since the advent of neoliberalism, has been the systematic smashing of the civil society in the United States. And if uh, this is a technical academic term, but I always, and Gramsci is helpful in this area as well, but I always look at this in terms of the, the, the public space or the personal space that's outside the parameters of the politics and the economics, okay? And, and, and there is no public space anymore. For example, workers 40, 50, 60, 70 years ago on Friday went to the tavern or the pub and talked about their common problems, okay? Um, et, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, tr uh, trade unions have been smashed uh, in the 60s, uh, let's say, uh, what's the figure, 35% 30, of the private workforce were unionized, now it's less than 5%, for example. So we've seen the systematic breakdown of the public space and the civil society. Let's get on with this a little quicker, because the reasons are what I really want to talk about. The second point is the crisis of political legitimacy. And just a simple dictionary definition of legitimacy is the belief that a rule, institution, or leader has the right to govern. Okay? I'll read, say that again. The belief that a rule, institution, or leader has the right to govern. Um, one could debate when this moment of acute political delegitimation has taken place, but let's just throw out a few obvious points. 2008, Obama is elected president. Uh, Trump and others said that he wasn't a U.S. citizen, okay, therefore he didn't have the legitimate right to be the president. That theme never left over a year period into different uh, areas. Uh, in 2016, uh, Trump wins the election, but not, I'm not going to say every liberal Democrat, but every liberal Democrat I know believes that Putin was responsible for Trump becoming president. Therefore, he was not a legitimate president, okay? Uh, but the tables have been turned since 2020 because there isn't one Dem Republican who believes Biden is a legitimate president as well. So you have this very acute uh, uh, delegitimation of the political system. I think those are the, the obvious points. Academically, we could go into more detail, but I think I, I've made my point here. Um, just point of information, prior... I've been actually wrestling with when did this all start in the last week or so as I was preparing this presentation. I'm going to kind of argue that the transition was 1980 to 1992, Reagan and Bush won. 
they were even though they were conservative, they were legitimate rulers. Uh, people, and, and then prior to that, how the how it went, the president might be a Republican or a Democrat. You were opposed to the Republican or the Democrat, or you didn't like their politics or their policies, but you did recognize they were true, duly elected officials and they had the right to govern. Since 1992, that's not been the case. Uh, Clinton was impeached of, over uh, the fact that he had consensual sex with a young woman in the White House, okay, which seems to me not really grounds for impeachment, uh, to say the least. But certainly the Republicans were after Clinton for months and years, and the idea was to weaken or discredit or paralyze the, the administration. Uh, 2000, the election in 2000, the conservative right-wing Supreme Court refused to allow the re, uh, the re vote, recounting of votes in Florida, giving uh, Bush to the presidency, which I personally believed at the time was, was a coup d'etat, for example. Uh, the, the, uh, Gore, for whatever his reasons, largely because he was part of the game, or part of the team, didn't challenge that, and I believe he could have, but he chose not to. Uh, and then certainly uh, what we've talked about before related to uh, Trump not being legitimate from liberal point of view and Biden not being legitimate from a conservative point of view. Uh, the third area of, of crisis is the crisis of global hegemony. and. I'm not going to spend any time on this except to say that 1991, when the Soviet Union disintegrated, the United States had the ability to pursue what I like to call absolute global hegemony. Parts of the world that was off limits for the United States became possible. So you begin to see wars in the Middle East, et cetera, et cetera, Militarily, military encirclement of Russia, NATO enlargement all kinds of things that almost, I mean, I assume all of you in the room are aware of. In recent years, what we've seen is the acceleration of, of uh, obstacles to that pursuit, not just military uh, obstacles, but also geopolitical obstacles as well. Meaning, we've seen uh, uh, the world rapidly moving towards a multipolar world order, which the United States, which means the United States increasingly cannot have control or influence over. And just in the last week or so, we saw events in South Africa dealing with the BRICS, which, uh, you know, I don't want to overstate something, but I think we've seen a major, major historical moment of change uh, in world geopolitics. Also the coups in, in uh, West Africa, I think, play into this as well, okay. Uh, by the way, along with this crisis of global hegemony, uh, increasingly the only lever that the U.S. has is what has been referred to as hybrid warfare which is uh, uh, using financialization, sanctions on one level, color revolutions and propaganda on another, and proxy wars on the other level. And uh, the world is in, 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 embroiled with those, uh, that hybrid uh, warfare as we speak, and I think everybody is aware of that. Uh, what I'd like to do now is uh, go into the next area and talk about how did the United States get to this point. Uh, and what I'm going to attempt to do is simply tr provide a historical context to understand the state of things today, okay? And to do that, we have to go back uh, quite a bit of time. Um, 
there's a lot of information, but I'm going to try to distill it into uh, uh, a few points as best I can. Um, I think the, it, the other aspect of dealing with history is not only historical context, but also the periodization of history. I strongly believe in periodizing history. The, the, uh, the American Revolutionary Period, which is about 1763 to 1787, uh, the Great Depression, uh, et cetera, et cetera. I think you guys are with me on this. Uh, the first po period is anywhere between the 1870s and certainly 18, or 1933, as in the beginning when Roosevelt comes into office, up until about 68 through 80. So let's say 1870 to 1880 is the first period. That period is characterized from my vantage point as a period of national development, uh, characterized by a national development model. The industrial plant was in the United States. Its labor supply was in the United States. The bulk of its markets were in the United States. A large amount of its natural resources were in the United States. Starting in 33, you begin to see the modern American experience, uh, although it really starts with the so-called progressive period around 19, 1900. But under Roosevelt, we see the beginnings of Keynesian mechanisms to create demand in the, in the, in the country. Uh, after the war, we see the uh, introduction of military Keynesianism uh, as well. What's interesting, neoliberalism and monetarism smashed Keynesianism as a whole, but they never tampered with military Keynesianism. Next year's fiscal budget for the U.S. military will be over $900 billion, okay? Can you imagine what you could do with $900 billion for health, education, and housing? Yeah. It's just unbelievable what could be done. Uh, the ideological frame, uh, by the way, there was also a limited, during this period, 33 into the period between 1968 and 1980, was a limited welfare state, okay? And I say limited because if you contrast that to many uh, examples of social democracy in Europe, it was an extremely limited uh, uh, welfare state, just uh, in the area of transportation, for example. Uh, the train systems were dismantled and automobiles and freeways were built in the United States during that period. Now, the second major period is uh, 1968 to 1980. There's going to be three periods here. 1968 to 1980. And during that period, what we see is the dismantlement of Keynesianism, the introduction of monetarism, which I like to call the neoliberal uh, accumulation regime. That's my term. You can use whatever term you want. And you see the deindustrialization of the society as well, where initially factories in the Northeast were shipped to the South because there were no labor unions in the South. And then quickly they were sent to Brazil and Argentina and eventually to Southeast Asia and then eventually to China, where labor costs were dirt cheap or even cheaper than that, to be honest with you. So uh, you see the restructuring of the U.S. political economy to, between 1968 and 1980. Again, uh, a neoliberal regime was put into place and the deindustrialization of society. So the political economy was, over a period of time, was completely changed. Uh, what is also very important is that the dominant or hegemonic ideology was changed as well from corporate liberalism to neoliberalism as the dominant ideology. Uh, corporate liberalism is basically liberalism where uh, there are excesses or problems or crises within the system. It's the responsibility of the state 
to reform, to rectify those crises, okay? For example, Dr. King and the Civil Rights Movement saw that racism, institutional racism, was a problem. So you petition the government through civil disobedience and the like. It wasn't an easy process, but nevertheless, that's the mechanism. And then the system responds supposedly accordingly and rectifies some of those problems. Now, obviously, civil rights were addressed, but social justice and economic rights were not address, addressed. And it's not by accident when Dr. King began to shift from civil rights to social justice, he happened to be assassinated, okay? Curious kind of phenomena there, okay? Uh, now, so you see a, a, a shift to neoliberalism where the market is good and the state is bad, okay? And it's drilled into people uh, up, until the, up until today. Now, when we talk about some of the causes today, that thread still holds to this particular point. On the political level, which is what we really want to focus on throughout the rest of our comments, two things happen that I think are very important. The political center is moved over a period of time from the center, okay? Now, I don't have a blackboard. I can't function without a blackboard, okay? Let's just say from 1945 to 1980, you have an umbrella, okay? And, on, and you have the parameters of the umbrella. On one side is socialism, the other side is fascism, okay? And then the political center is the political establishment. And the center has both Democrats, New Deal liberal Democrats, Roosevelt, Truman, and Johnson. And it has uh, Republicans who are committed to corporate liberalism and Keynesianism, and that would be Eisenhower. So you have the modern conservative and the modern liberal. And then you have to the left is the reform liberals who believe in the system, but see problems, and then they those issues and the system is allegedly supposed to respond and then you have an, a left and you had two lefts one was the old left you know, communists and socialists the McCarthy period purges the old left and my generation comes along in the 60s and we create the new left without any knowledge about the old left by the way it took us years to find out what that old left was about on the right you had a con conservatives who were basically mainstream conservatives, uh, many of them not opposed to civil rights. They were mainly concerned about fiscal issues and not social issues, okay, per se, abortion, for example. And then you had the extreme right, which was the Ku Klux Klan, the White Citizens Council, and uh, the John Birch Society, okay. And you really didn't have uh, contemporary neo-fascists like we have in the United States. Although you could say the White Citizens Council were pretty fascistic in their behavior, to say the least. So that's, that's how it was 45, 33, 45 to say 68, 80. From 60, from 68, 80, but from 80 for sure, uh, the political center has moved further and further to the right, where I personally believe it butts up against the fascist line, okay? Now, to prove that point, that the Democrats' social policies are far to the right of Richard Nixon, okay? <laughs> to give you some idea. We hated Nixon, okay? I wish he was back, <laughs> okay, to show you how bad things are, okay? So I think my point is made is the political centers move to the right. And we'll kind of elus we'll, ex we'll expand on that in a little while. The next point is really the root of the core, I believe, of the problem that we're facing today. And that is the, uh, the nature of the two-party system. Uh, and in fact, if... I were to distill this, when I'm talking to the taxi drivers, okay, I say that the problems are rooted in deindustrialization 
and the restructuring of the two-party systems electoral coalitions, okay? And so this is what I'd like to talk about. The two-party system was changed under the neoliberal regime as well. Now, who funds the parties haven't changed much except we see the advent of high tech and all of this. Wall Street, uh, which becomes dominant under monopoly financialization under the neoliberal regime, where prior Wall Street was regulated under Glass-Steagall and another, a, a, a lot of other regulatory mechanisms. Keep in mind, Jimmy Carter is the one that began to deregulate the banks. Okay, so he, he plays a dastardly role in all of this as well, although he's got a good image after he was president. In fact, I wrote my PhD dissertation on Carter and his policy towards Angola, which was hypercritical of Carter. But um, many years later, I was getting a copy of it made at, my, uh, at a copy store in Chico, and one of my old classmates was walking out the, down the sidewalk, and I, I said, hey, what's going on? And he said, oh, I'm going down to see President Carter this weekend down at the Carter Center. And I said, that's amazing. I wrote my dissertation on Carter, and here it is. <laughs> and he said, give it to me. I'll give it to Carter, okay? So he carried my dissertation down to Carter. I said, but don't take it until I write a letter, okay? And so I wrote a letter to Carter, and I said, as you can see by this dissertation, I'm highly critical of you because my argument was, that the second Cold War did not start under Reagan, it started under Carter, okay? And I prove it in my dissertation. Uh, but uh, I say, since you were president, you've done some great things. Habitat for Humanity, et cetera, et cetera. And so, uh, uh, I forgot the guy's name, but he took the dissertation down, and I have a proud photograph of him giving my dissertation to Jimmy Carter, okay? Although I don't think Carter read my letter. I think one of his staff read the letter because that's who wrote me back, okay, not Carter. But anyway, I'm digressing here, but there's already always fun stories in all of this as well. Now, so uh, Wall Street, big oil, uh, and the military industrial complex are the major funders of both parties. Uh, the right wing Sunbelt wealth we used to call, I'm not sure what we call it today, are funders of the Republicans and not the Democrats. And then high tech tends to be posited in the, in the Democratic wing, not necessarily the, the Republican wing. But where also, but again, what's very important is there was a major shift in the electoral coalitions of the two parties. And this, to me, I think is, besides the economic realities and the ideological realities, the structural root of where we are today. Let me talk about uh, the party system as I see it. Most people in the United States, and I guess many people around the world, look at Democrats as the, the candidate. Today, it's Biden and, and Trump. But in normal times, it isn't just that candidate. What's around the candidate is, one, a, a, a block of finance. And then beneath the candidate, or around the candidate specifically, is the party apparatus. And beneath that is what you call an electoral coalition. Now, the block that finances it is pretty obvious. But each party has to have voters, okay? And to get voters, you have to appeal to the voters with things that you can offer the voters, okay? Uh, Pro-social programs, jobs, uh, uh, and, and a variety of different kinds of things. During the first stage that we talked about, the corporate liberal stage under Roosevelt into the 70s, Thank you, thank you, thank you. The Democratic Party's electoral coalition was basically class-based. 
workers, unions, African Americans, and liberals, okay? That was basically their, their electoral coalition. The, the Republicans basically were uh, wealthy Wall Street elites, and academic elites, business elites, who were linked to the Eastern establishment, as well as a mainstream conservative Republicans, okay? They really weren't wedded to the right wing as we understand it. And in fact, the Southern Democrats, which was the basis for the White Citizens Council and all that, they were linked to the Democratic Party, okay? Not the Republican Party. Um, and in fact, if you study Truman in around 19, the 1948 election, we see a lot of interesting developments where he's kind of trapped. Uh, he needs to get black urban votes, but he's got support from Southern Democrats. So he does a couple things to appease black voters by integrating the military, which maybe was important. I personally wish he'd done some other kinds of things. But what we see is the Southern Democrats bolt from the Democratic Party and run their own candidate, which was Strom Thurmond, okay? But I, I think I've made my point. Now, starting with Reagan, you be, in, or 1980, you begin to see a restructuring of the electoral coalition of the two parties, where the Democrats move from being a class-based electoral base because if you're supporting a neoliberal agenda that's breaking unions and supporting deindustrialization, you don't have an organized working class anymore. So you have to shift to something else. So the, what did they shift, it, shift to? They shifted to identity politics, okay? You, you got a black, you got a white woman, you got a gay, you got a um, Hispanic, you got an Asian. Uh, you, you know, uh, uh, and now you have a transgender, okay? Now, the trick is, if you look at the educational background of all of those individuals that are picked, they all went to Harvard or Yale. Not one of them has any real connection with working class blacks or working class white women or working class Hispanics. You understand what I mean? But the image is that they are representative. It's inclusive. We have diversity, etc. Also, the other part of the trick is since under neoliberalism, government is not creating social programs anymore, they're doing just the opposite, the Democrats get maintain support from those groups by supporting issues that don't cost any money, okay? We support choice, okay? Now, you could spend a lot of money for clinics and the like, but you're not going to do that. Uh, so women are going to support the Democrats because the Democrats support choice. Gay people are going to support uh, the Democrats because they support same-sex marriage. It doesn't cost any money for same-sex marriage. But you get, you get my point. For blacks, is we're going to defend affirmative action, okay? You could spend money supporting affirmative action, but you don't. It still is the glue. You guys see what I'm saying here? Mm -hmm. So. You change the uh, uh, the uh, electoral coalition base uh, under the Democratic Party. What did the Republicans do? As the as the political center is moving to the right, the Republicans increasingly uh, become more conservative, more conservative, more conservative, more conservative. So. They promote, uh, th their constituencies are social conservatives, okay, who are against abortion, against same-sex marriage, against affirmative action, etc. Now, the old uh, Republicans in the previous period, their daughters and wives got abortions, okay? It wasn't an issue, okay? Uh, but now, the, the fabric has changed because now a core constituent group for the electoral coalition for the Republicans are social conservatives. The other area that's very important is that Republicans now are attracting 
what was called in the 80s Reagan Democrats. These were white male workers who were in unions who, for a variety of reasons, did not like civil rights, did not like women beginning to get influence within the system, did not like gays, etc. And so even though their class interests to a point, to a degree, was being defended by, or at least through lip service, being supported by the, by the Democrats, they now are going to begin voting for, uh, the, for the Republicans. I have a brother, I have two brothers, one good brother and one bad brother. The bad brother is a born-again Christian still after 40 years, and I remember arguing with him on the phone. He, he was going to vote for uh, one of the Bush boys, and I said, you can't do that. He, 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 the, you can't vote for these people. He said, I'm going to vote. He's in a union in Hollywood, by the way. He still gets really good benefits from the union. But he voted for the Republican because the Republicans supported it. It was against abortion. Okay, So you see a large wing of, of, of working class people, white working class people, shifting over to the Republican Party. And then you, the third group, which would be the evangelicals uh, or the fundamentalists, shifted to the Republicans, where they didn't really play a role at all in the previous electoral coalitions, both Democrat and Republican, during the pre-80 period. And then as the, uh, and also the uh, police unions and members of the military voted Republican as well because the, the Republicans are strong on, on the military. Uh, although the Democrats are doing a pretty fair job in supporting the military as well. The other group, as the country has gone further and further to the right, you gradually begin to see ultra-nationalists and neo-Nazis, uh, uh, neo-fascists as part of the constituency. But I would say this becomes most transparent with Trump when he comes into office. And this incident in Fayetteville, uh, Virginia, as you remember, uh, uh, where the young woman was run over in a car and killed, where Trump said, well, you know, his concession to balance was there were good people on both sides, you know. I think being in Germany, you understand how, how wrong that view is. So this, this is very, very important. Now, uh, I know you're eager to ask some questions. Let me try to go through some points real quick here. Uh, the, the move right was consolidated by Reagan. Bush won, managed the end of the Cold Wars, which is another topic. In 92, you begin to see the beginnings of what I call an inner Nissan, inner Nissan war within the political establishment and the ruling, uh, the ruling class over controlling of the state, which means controlling policy, controlling the presidency, uh, and benefiting from the, res the resources of policy from the state as well. I've already mentioned Clinton and the impeachment of 92, the 2000 uh, electoral uh, de debacle, et cetera. Um, now, 2008 to 2016, uh, you have the beginnings of economic crisis within uh, the neoliberal regime, which we could expand on, but we're not. Uh, how demand was sustained through the 80s, 90s, into the 2000s was not th through uh, Keynesian policies. They were sustained through what uh, economist David Jaffe calls privatized Keynesianism. Uh, the three areas of privatized Keynesianism was now, rather than one job holder in the family, you had multiple people make working to make it to survive. And then you had credit card debt was used to survive and then uh, refinancing one's mortgages uh, was another way to survive. I know this quite well because I the house for about 32 years and I refinanced that sucker five times. I wouldn't have gotten my PhD if I hadn't been able to refinance the house. We've come to a point where that's exhausted now, okay? 
which amplifies the domestic crisis in our country, which is where I'm headed. Okay, now, let's see where I'm at. The financial crisis occurs in 2008. Rather than restructure, going to now a demand-based economy, a more redistributive model, uh, maybe a return to some form of Keynesianism, you see the continuation of the neoliberal regime, which could continues to stagnate and create more and more economic troubles for the majority of people. Um, let me move on. So, uh, so by 2016, I would argue it became very difficult for the ruling class and the political establish establishment to present to the public that the neoliberal regime was creating prosperity and social mobility because it was very obvious it wasn't. Now what I want to stress very strongly is that the foundation of the New Deal liberalism between 1945 into the 1970s was that it did promise prosperity and generally delivered and promised social mobility. I'm a product of that because I was born in the South, in Mississippi in the 19, 1840s or whatever year it was. And uh, my father was a carpenter, he was a worker in a union, and I became a university professor, okay? So I am a victim, I mean a product of that, uh, that dynamic. Now, let's talk about the 2016 election. Um, and this refers to what I, all of the points I've talked about so far, I think, are distilled into this election. And certainly at the core of it would be the crisis of legitimacy for the, polit for the political center, which would be mainstream Democrats and mainstream Republicans. In 2016, that was Hillary Clinton and Jeb Bush, okay? Now I'm going to have a little sidebar here. For, for decades and decades and decades, the, the, the political scientists could predict who was going to get the nomination of the two parties because the individual that had the most money in January 1st going into that year always got the nomination. Okay, I mean, it was almost a truism. Who had the most money January 1st, 2016? Jeb Bush. Everybody thought we're going to have a third Jeb Bush. And some people were even thinking we're going to finally get a good one. <laughs> you, know, we, you know, we tried it two times before. Now, but what, what happened was this, this uh, crisis of legitimacy was in place. No longer did people trust the system. And the economy was, was creating insecurity rather than security. Uh, so what you see is a, a response by large sectors of the, of the society, one to the left, or the liberal left, and other, the other to the right. The liberal left supported Bernie Sanders, okay, as a candidate to get the nomination. Now Sanders' candidacy was rooted in the Occupy movement that had taken place a few years earlier and was beginning to die out. And I think you're all familiar with that. The 1% and we are the 99. Um, and what Sanders argued, promoting a populist position from the left, he said that Wall Street and inequality was the cause of the problem and we needed social reforms. Now the Democratic Party, which was committed to neoliberalism, isn't going to allow that to, him to get the nomination. So they shut him down pretty quickly through the primary system, even though he got some 13 million votes during that period. It, it was Hillary's turn, and, and nobody was going to question that, regardless of uh, how many votes Sanders got. On the other side of the coin, this is where Donald Trump comes into the picture, who had been contemplating run for, running for the president for a number of years prior to this. But he comes into the fold representing a populist right position uh, rooted in the Tea Party movement 
uh, of Republicans uh, that had been around for the previous 10 years. Um, his position was to make America great again, okay? Now, what did that mean? Well, for being African-American, I thought that meant make America white again, okay? Uh, which was part of what it meant, okay? Uh, what it also meant was to take America, to take America back to some mystical period when America was great. I don't remember any time that America was great. It had aspirations to be great, but there was, an, there was always racism, you know, homophobia, you know, inequality, poverty, police violence. But what they were talking about is some kind of image of the 1950s, okay, when everything seemed to be okay during that period. It was a period of turmoil nevertheless. Uh, so Trump's view was that the uh, 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 Make America Great Again was America first, but not the internationalist position. Therefore, the Trump position was supported by national interests rather than internationalist or globalist issues. Uh, and it was based on an ethno-nationalism, or a racialized nationalism was what it was based on. Uh, and so, uh, he w was able to attract large segments of the Republican coalition that already existed, including increasing numbers of ultra-nationalist and neo-fascist and neo-right organizations. Those that rallied in his behalf January 6th at the White House, if you remember those events, okay. Now, I think I've made my point, uh, but I'd like to finish up with a, a few observations. Uh, why did Trump win in 216? Let's see what the other question is. And then why has Trump been targeted by the Democrats, okay? I may surprise you on a few points here, okay? By the way, uh, I didn't vote for either one, okay? <laughs> by the way, uh, and I certainly wouldn't vote for Trump, but I definitely wouldn't vote for Hillary Clinton either. Okay, uh, but why did Trump win? The first point is it's clear based on the, uh, the populist left constituency and the populist right constituency that 2016 was a change election year. There needed to be change. The public was demanding change. Sanders was proposing change. Trump was proposing change, whether you agree with their change or not. Clinton, on the other hand, ran as Obama's third term, okay? Continuity and stability, okay? Uh, so she missed the point from the very beginning. Uh, secondly, Clinton could have won if she appointed Sanders as vice president, okay? But because the centrist neoliberal Democrats did not want a social Democrat, to be on the ticket, that wasn't going to happen. So uh, the Democrats were playing uh, suicide already. And sec thirdly, uh, Clinton's campaign was a horrible campaign. They wanted to run against Trump. They thought they were going to beat Trump, okay? And they didn't campaign thoroughly enough. For example, the three key states that turned the tide in the election with a total of 74,100 votes was Pennsylvania, Michigan, and Wisconsin. Clinton did not go to Wisconsin, Michigan, or Pennsylvania to campaign because we're going to win those states, okay? The arrogance was unbelievable, all right? Um, and the incompetency of what uh, Mr. Moot, I forgot, the young man who ran her campaign. Uh, and then the other real problem, too, was uh, the Democrats were controlled by this Democratic Leadership Council, which is the Clintons and the Gores and the Obamas, okay? And, um, and they're not, it's not open, and Biden, by the way, is part of it. That's why 
you got to be 85 years old to run for the presidency of the United States. There's no room to have young blood in the Democratic Party, especially if their uh, uh, sense, you know, support a social democratic position. Um, what do I, I want to say one more point here. Uh, oh yeah, and also Clinton's campaign was, was uninspiring except for the true believers, okay? And I'll give you an example of one true believer. When I lived in San Francisco during this period, I had a neighbor named Carmen, and she was a good friend of mine, a friend of mine, not a great friend, but a good friend. And we were talking about politics one day, and I made some of these comments, and she said, leave my Hillary alone. <laughs> that was the attitude of a lot of, uh, of liberal white women in the United States over this position. Now, why did Trump win? Uh, it wasn't because of Putin. Okay, although Democrats still believe that's the case. You believe it's true? Yeah. yeah. No, no, well, come on, that's ridiculous. I mean, it, it's impossible. Uh, I mean, $100,000 by trolls in Russia, two-thirds of the money after the election, you know, I mean, when, I think, what, how many billions, $4 billion is spent on a campaign and $100,000 is gonna make a difference? No way, no way, no way. Uh, but anyway, uh, here's the rub about Trump. Believe it or not, his message resonated with voters, okay? Now, he's a thug, he's narcissistic, he, is not, he, is, he does not reflect, he's somebody that I do not want to sit down and have a beer with, okay, at all, but he's brilliant related to his instinctual ability to sell himself to certain people. But aren't all demagogues that way, okay? Germany has a specific history of that happening, okay? So one shouldn't be surprised, okay? And then when you start adding up the, the sectors of the economy that supported him, some disaffected white workers, but a large segment of the petty bourgeoisie supported Trump, educated people, women, okay? because of their economic position that Trump said he was going to defend. You guys understand what I'm saying here? So uh, it resonated with him. Now, some people voted also because, unfortunately, he's a, Dem he's a Republican. I always vote Republican. Interestingly, many elite Republicans, like the Bushies, they didn't vote at all, okay, because they couldn't vote for Trump for obvious reasons, and they weren't going to vote Democrat. Uh, some people voted, again, because he was a Republican. Some people voted because they hated Democrats. Some people hate, voted for Trump because they hated black people or hated gays or hated white women who had jobs and PhDs, uh, or th they hated Clinton. Uh, and many of them might have been sexist, okay? So there was a whole bunch of reasons. But what we also have to realize, he promised jobs to people, okay? Now, he never delivered for a lot of reasons because he never was going to deliver. This is all dem uh, demagogic stuff. Mm -hmm. The system wasn't going to allow him to deliver, the political system. And corporations and the neoliberal regime weren't going to allow him to deliver. But people still believed him, okay? And he, here's also the rub. He promised to end feudal costly wars, is what he promised. And even I thought, that's a good idea, okay? Let's end the war in Syria, for example. Let's end the conflict, U.S. involvement in Iraq. Now, he wasn't allowed to do those things, but he promised he was going to do that. And here's the key thing that he promised to do. He was going to normalize relations with Russia. Okay? He was going to normalize relations with Russia. We wouldn't have the war today if he had been able to normalize relations with Russia. Okay? Now, 
I think I've made my point there. Now, one final set of points, and then we can drink some beer or wine or whatever we're going to drink. Okay, why has Trump been targeted by the Democrats, by the corporate-owned media, and everybody else on the so-called liberal side of the equation? Maybe another way of laying it out is what are his, what are his political crimes? Is it because he's an asshole? Nope. Is it because uh, he uh, is boorish and thuggish? Nope. I think Biden is pretty thuggish, believe it or not, if you look at what he says and how he says it and what he does. Uh, he, he, his crimes are threefold. One, he staged a hostile takeover of the Republican Party establishment, okay? He staged a hostile takeover, unprecedented in American politics, where an outsider self-financed took over a party, okay? Now, parties are supposed to vet people and, and groom people, okay? You're supposed to be a governor and a senator before you can become a presidential nominee, okay? Uh, there have been a couple exceptions to that rule, but George Washington was never a senator before he became president. But that's the way it's supposed to operate. He staged a hostile takeover. We, you saw the debates. Jeb Bush was supposed to be the man. He, Trump tore those people up, okay? And every time he said something nasty that was offensive or that's beyond the pale, a lot of the people who listened to him enjoyed him giving the finger to the Democrats for the reasons I just described. Now, this is not the way a democracy operates, and certainly how a civil society should be, but we're talking about the U.S. of America, U.S. of A., okay? a society that is in grave trouble. The second crime that he made was that he was not a member of the internationalist-oriented ruling class or political establishment. He was rich, but he wasn't on any corporate boards of directors. He was not a member of any policy planning organization. He was not a member of the Council on Foreign Relations, for example. He was not a member of any foundation, for example. And he did not participate in any establishment summits. The Aspen Institute, Davos, the Bohemian Club. Understand, all of those things that groom you to get into the hierarchy. So he was not the he he was going to be the target. The fourth, the third reason is he was uncontrollable. Okay, uh, and that's what RussiaGate was about was trying to control him. He ran on a platform of normalizing relations with Russia. On paper, at the end of four years, he was the most hostile anti-Russian president since the Cold War because the, the, the state bureaucracy around him made sure that they were going to achieve their goals, okay? And when he tried to use Zelensky to get information on Biden, he was impeached, okay? It was just, it wasn't going to go anywhere, but it's part of the disruption and the, and the paralysis of, of keeping him under control. Um, the, the fourth reason, and this is to me, where I come into this story, his, fo his foreign policy proposals were not in line with the internationalist foreign policy establishment. He wanted to end wars, okay? He wanted Europe to pay its fair share for its defense, okay? Uh, and significantly, he wanted to normalize relations with Russia. They couldn't allow that to happen because they wanted to go to war with Russia. They had 60 or 70 years of an, a, a structure that was anti-Soviet. It was never dismantled. It now became anti-Russia. And it despised Putin. Why did it despise Putin? It despised Putin because 
he was not Yeltsin. They despised Putin because he said, I'll trade with you. I want to be a partner with the West, but you have to respect Russian national security and national sovereignty. That's a no-no when you want to gain complete hegemony over Russia, when you want to dismantle Russia. You guys see what I'm saying here? So that was his major crime. Now he's trying to run for the presidency again. He's got major, uh, I think he's 26 points ahead of anybody running against him within the polls. And uh, the Democrats and the political establishment are trying to get rid of him again. Um, um, because they're still afraid that he might end the war in Ukraine, okay? Now there's more to it than that, but I personally believe that is the centerpiece. Because in this pursuit of, of global hegemony, the pursuit of absolute global hegemony, the U.S. has three targets. Uh, and we talked about this in my talk last time related to uh, McKinder. One, the U.S. does not want an independent West Europe, and it certainly doesn't want an independent Germany tied to Russian mm -hmm. economics. Okay? And so it needs to break Russia, uh, break Germany, and it's doing that. They, they blew up Nord Stream pipeline, etc. They want to break Russia, they want to dismantle Russia into several different malleable countries like they did Yugoslavia, and then they want to go to war with uh, China using Taiwan the same way they used Ukraine as a military platform to provoke China to do something to justify sanctions, isolation, increase weapons to Taiwan, etc., etc. That's the U.S. playbook, okay? It's as simple as that. And uh, Trump is a uh, Trump card pardon the pun, in that scenario. That's all I'm going to say. I hope this has been informative. This is one person's view. I've been studying this stuff for at least 60 years. Uh, Victor has a few more years on me, but I'm catching up. And this is how I see things right now. And I tell you, I've worked every single day for about eight or nine hours trying to distill what I, into what I just said, okay? Any comments, questions? Yes, sir. I have three questions. <laughs> First, um, what can you tell me about um, the the intention to weaken Russia by drawing them into the Afghan? Uh, or, or the Ukraine? No, no, Afghan. In, okay. In 1980, mm -hmm. in the. Okay, I'm, I'm actually writing a book on that right oh, now. Oh, great. Yeah, and uh, it's, I, again, I wrote on Carter, then I wrote a book about in U.S. Mm -hmm. policy Angola, and now I'm writing about Carter and Afghanistan, so I know all the stuff about C Carter, so I'm just shifting to Afghanistan. Mm -hmm. um, as, 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 real quickly, uh, in 68, you had the Tet Offensive in Vietnam, mm -hmm. which caused the breakdown of consensus. Mm -hmm. oh, excuse me. A breakdown of consensus which, within the U.S. foreign policy establishment. Mm -hmm. And it can be well documented that now there are divisions within the policy establishment over what to do. The consensus was we got to find a way to get out of Vietnam. It's too costly. So you see a shift to Vietnamization. Okay. From that point on, there are struggles in the foreign policy establishment over controlling U.S. foreign policy. And you see three different tendencies. You see Nixon and Kissinger, who proposed globalist approach, which was detente with linkage, okay? And then uh, there was criticism of that, and then Brzezinski and Rockefeller start the Trilateral Commission, which was bringing in Europe and Japan into this trilateral apparatus with detente. And then soon as Carter gets elected, because he was a product of the Trilateral Commission, you see the reconstitution of the Committee on the Present Danger, which existed in 1950, to promote uh, NSC 68, which was the blueprint for the Cold War. Mm -hmm. And uh, and so didn't they were they were creating more chaos. So the U.S. looked at this as an opportunity. 
to suck the, the Soviet Union into Afghanistan. Mm -hmm. Although, when you argue they were responsible for the Soviet Union going in, there were multiple reasons. Mm -hmm. But Brzezinski himself said in an interview 10 years later, we did what we could to induce the Soviet mm -hmm. Union to go into Afghanistan. And the goal, using Brzezinski's language, is we wanted them to have their own Vietnam. Yeah. And then over the next five to six years, the goal was to bleed the, the Soviet so, Union. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And obviously, the end result was the disintegration. I don't yeah. believe Afghanistan was the fundamental cause, but the Americans still believe that that was the linchpin mm -hmm. to the disintegration. This particular moment now, they have the same blueprint. If you can suck the South Russia into, into Ukraine, you can continue to arm Ukraine, yeah. it will bleed Russia. That's, and and it, the, the spring offensive has failed, okay? Everybody in the world knows that, okay, on the part of the yeah. Ukrainians. 400, at least 400,000 Ukrainians have been killed in this war so far, in a year, in a half. This is unbelievable, okay? And, and uh, Peskov, a couple days ago, gave a talk, says uh, the, the, the offensive has failed. Basically, what are you going to do next? We're, we're ready to talk. If you escalate, we're continuing to fight. Blinken is in Kiev today, giving a billion dollars, okay? Know. Uh, you know, how many people are they? Master. But the point is, related to the Afghanistan story, a million Afghanis died. You think the U.S. cares? No, no way. No. 400,000 Ukrainians, if they continue, how many Ukrainians are going to die? The U.S. doesn't care at all, okay? No at all. 50,000 Russians have died. They don't care, okay? Because it, it's it's, it's cold-hearted politics. It's geopolitics yeah. is what it's about. What's your second question? Straussian. Le Leo, Leo, Leo Strauss, yes. 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 What yeah. about him and the influence of the neoconservative or neoliberal uh, oh, movement? Yeah, well, that, that's a, another, that's a classroom, that's another classroom answer there. Real quickly, what we say is that, that you have a foreign policy establishment. Uh, generally, uh, people go to Harvard, or they, and they go to Yale, they go to Princeton, they go to Georgetown, maybe Stanford, uh, occasionally USC, but it's basically those key universities. You get jobs in corporations, you join think tanks, you mm. write papers, mm. uh, you know, then eventually you're appointed as Under Secretary of State, and maybe eventually if you play your cards, you might become Secretary of State, etc. Within that, at specifically historic periods of time, there are different policy tendencies mm. that exist, meaning how you approach things, okay? Uh, real quick, Today, the dominant, not the dominant, the controlling tendency are the neoconservatives, mm. who, are, believe it or not, are rooted in, their parents are rooted in Trotskyism from the 1930s. Instead of permanent socialist revolution, it's permanent democratic revolution using militarism and American exceptionalism, okay? Mm -hmm. And they're bullet-headed artists that are, are that, that they have no peripheral vision at all. They have dominated foreign policy uh, they, uh, since, uh, since Bush II, Cheney and Rumsfeld and these mm -hmm. jokers. They existed during Carter, but there are other tendencies. J James Baker, uh, Scowcroft, they were realists, okay? They're all pro-U.S., they're anti-communist, but they're willing to sit down and negotiate as long as the results of the terms benefit the U.S. Mm. But th there is no such thing as negotiations within the mentality of the neoconservatives, okay? Mm. Which is part of the, the, the problem we face related to finding some political solution here. Uh, you guys all know about John Mersheimer, for example. You've probably heard Mersheimer give his lectures. Mm. Mersheimer what was, I mean, he still is technically a member of the foreign policy establishment. But he is a realist, okay? Mm -hmm. And two things he's done to, to not have any credibility. In 2015, he wrote an article in the Council of Foreign Relations Journal of Foreign Affairs 
that said that the West was responsible for uh, the Ukraine crisis, which is true, okay? Mm. So he's out, and then his colleague Stephen Walt and him wrote a book about the Zionist lobby in the United States, APAC. So he can't have any influence anymore. So the realists are not part of the system. During the Obama period, you had uh, two wings. You had neoconservatives and you had the liberal interventionist, okay? Samantha Powers, Susan Rice, etc. They believe in intervening uh, in militarily, but for humanitarian purposes, okay? We'll go into Kosovo to prevent a genocide. We'll go into Libya to present, prevent a genocide. Well, you going into Kosovo, are you going into Lib Libya, are creating the genocide, okay? But it's their rationale. But even the liberal uh, uh, interventionists are not part of the Biden team at this point. It's purely the neoconservatives. Mm -hmm. and, and I don't, it's related to the crisis of the United States, as I said earlier, about the only option it has is hybrid warfare. The only sector that can carry that out without question and questioning are the neoconservatives, okay? The realists are, would, if the realists would be in power, they would be, they would not, they would have endorsed the peace agreement in Istanbul last March, and the war would have been over, over a year ago, okay? Uh, but that's not the case. Anybody, you've had your two, let's have somebody else. Yes, sir. I also have two questions. Okay. Uh, my first question is about, uh, Trump has um, at least proposed ways to retrieve money, uh, tens of billions of dollars, to un the United States, for example, by um, cancelling um, or retrieving from Afghanistan and uh, forcing European countries to pay for their defense themselves, you mentioned it. How, uh, and this would possibly retrieves tens, if not hundreds of billions of dollars to the United States. Um, how do the Democrats, uh, do they have um, similar plans? Or do they have other ways to retrieve tens, if not hundreds of billions of dollars? You raise a very important question. And, and one of the ironies of this whole story is that much of what Trump proposed, Biden is doing, okay? For example, uh, going into two six, going into two seventeen, when Trump entered the White House, the Democrats more or less towards China supported what we call engagement. Okay, uh, engaging uh, economically, but militarily encircling uh, the uh, what was the shift to the pivot to Asia was what it was called, and some arms with uh, Taiwan, but not with large amounts. Trump comes in and promotes that agenda. Biden has escalated that agenda. Related to confiscating resources, uh, uh, Trump, I don't know how many billions of, of dollars in reserves that they confiscated from uh, Venezuela, but since the war started, um, I think it's $140 billion worth of Russian reserves have been frozen mm -hmm. by the United States vis-a-vis uh, -vis Russia. So it, it has the ability of freezing foreign ex reserves, a country's foreign ex reserves that are in uh, banks in the West or the United States is how they're able to achieve that. Mm -hmm. uh, and then related to... Uh, the border issue, uh, Biden is not doing much different than what uh, Trump did uh, related to uh, the border as well. Where there's fundamental differences over the, the uh, Russia, uh, uh, meaning the escalation towards Russia. What's your second question? Is there any possibility of an end of the Ukraine war? Uh, so there are maybe two possible ways. One is uh, uh, um, if both sides come to an agreement and the other way I see is if the West and mainly the United States 
stop uh, the arms and uh, economical supply, which makes up, I think, some say 90% of uh, Ukrainian uh, budget uh, up to today. Um, and is this possible? That, uh, that I'm, I'm, this I'm not laughing at you, I'm kind of laughing with you. You know, is it possible? Uh, any more of your question? Uh, because uh, Trump says that uh, he would stop uh, Ukraine support, but could he, even if he would become yeah, well, a, a lot of points of your question related to Trump stopping the war. Uh, if he was elected president, they'd stop Trump, okay? Uh, they, this war, is, the U.S. is not going to end the war, and I'll explain in a minute why. Um, related to... Uh, I think we all know that this war did not have to happen because you had the Minsk Accords that were signed in 215, which was acceptable to the Russians. And apparently, and when it was signed, it was acceptable to the French and the Germans as well as the Ukrainians. But what we've learned in the last year from Merkel, from Holan, and Poroshenko they were only playing with the Russians. They were stalling to give more time for the West to arm Kiev, okay? Uh, which also leads to the point is, can the Russians actually sit down at a negotiating table and trust the West in any form? I don't believe they can, okay? So that narrows what option. Uh, a lot of people are calling for negotiations. Yes, we'd love to have negotiations starting with a ceasefire. But you have to have trust in all of this, okay? Um, so, and then the next point about the U U.S., and, I, and what I'm about to say, I think, is common knowledge, and all of you guys probably know this. This is an existential war, okay? I'm quoting Mersheimer here. Neither side can afford to lose, okay? If Russia loses, Russia no longer exists, okay? It's as simple as that. It will be ravaged by Western imperialism to the core, okay? It will be divided and, and, and dismantled, okay? The Russian people know that, okay? They've seen this at least three times before. They saw it with Napoleon, they saw it with the Kaiser, and they saw it with Hitler, okay? They recognize what this is really about. On the other side, if the U.S. can't afford to lose either, because if you're battling to maintain global hegemony in a world that's rapidly moving towards multipolarity in the last week and a half, to amplify it, um, this uh, defeat would only further uh, force the decline of the credibility and legitimacy of the United States in the world. Now, how Europe, and this is the linchpin to this whole story, how Lure Europe responds to this is the $64,000 question. Victor knows a lot more about this than I do. But uh, Europe, you know, the, the dream scenario, if you will, is for Europe to sever its ties with NATO and the United States and operate as an independent force and uh, go in their natural being and, 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 and participate in Eurasian integration, which seems to be without climate catastrophe and nuclear war, the, the thrust or trajectory of where the future is going, okay? So um, I don't see the United States, the, the, the way the, and this is quoting Scott Ritter, okay, whatever you think of Scott Ritter, but he, he makes the most sense to me in, in the last week or so, the only way this war can end is the Russians winning a military victory and forcing uh, uh, you, you, the Kiev regime to get down on his knees and have an uh, uh, unconditional surrender, not unlike the Japanese in World War II. Uh, but we're not close to that today, okay? Uh, I, I personally think the Russians would like the war over, okay? Uh, but they're only responding to the escalation from the West. So th those are my views. Mm, yes. And uh, a small question connected to that. Could the United States exist in a global system where there aren't the global hegemon oh, or okay. hegemon or... Yeah. I can 
Get out of here. 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 That's, the, that's another, that's a big, big question. Uh, and we kind of addressed that in our talk a couple weeks ago. But the, the, this, this, I, the, the ideological aspect of manifest destiny, God gave the United States the right to conquer North America and to commit genocide against the native people. It, uh, the U.S. is the indispensable nation of what Obama says. American exceptionalism. Uh, the American century that Henry Luce, who was the publisher of Time, said in 1948. There, it is so instilled in the American religion that the world belongs to them. For them to sit down and be equals is, is really a difficult thing. And when you add the deep-seated racism that exists in the United States, not just against people of color, but against Slavic people, okay? Mm -hmm. Against Slavic people. That's, that, I don't, that is another factor why it would be difficult to see the U.S. Uh, sit down. But um, the, the scenarios are either nuclear war, or the U.S. finally figures it out. But the problem there also, there's always this idea, well, the young people will figure it out. But the anti-Russia, uh, the Russia phobia, the anti-Putin, the anti-Russia propaganda is so deeply embedded in the United States over the last 20 years. Uh, uh, it, I, I can't even see young people uh, you know, saying, you know, we can sit down with the Russians, for example. It's, it's just, somebody else, you had your three. Any other questions? Okay, it's time for me to eat and have a glass of wine, too, by the way, so we're going to have to pack it up now. Thank you for uh, letting me do this. Thank you. Thank you. All right, all right, good. Thank you, guys.